I'm, as Rashmi just said, I'm the Director General of the Centre for Science and Environment in, in India. And I thought it's important, I know for many of you, these are just assertions that we all believe in, but I thought for a minute, let me just put a few things on the table very clearly before we begin. One, we come from a country where we believe climate change is real. We believe we can see already the pain of what are possibly climate impacts. We already see the monsoons becoming more variable, more extreme, and certainly we believe that the Indian finance minister is a very honorable gentleman, but it's also very much the Indian monsoons. And so when the Indian monsoon starts getting more variable, more extreme, then we know that we are in trouble because that is our true finance minister. And we come knowing and being very clear. And I think it's important for us all in this hall to understand that as Indians, as an Indian environmentalist, we are very clear that the world needs to cut emissions drastically and urgently. We, we also believe that over time, negotiations, even though we've been having them for the last 20 years, are falling apart. We believe that the world is failing us. And we also believe that it's important for us to recognize that emissions are increasing, not just in the emerging countries where they will, but also in almost all countries. And what amazes us is that as much as there is a north-south divide on climate change, there is a north-south divide in the way media reports climate change as well. So these are inconvenient facts, and these are never reported. If you look at it, just in the last year, 2009-2010, um, there has been an increase, and the media has made very big of the increase of Chinese emissions, 10%, India's emission, 9% over the year. But what has not been highlighted is that the United States has also increased 4%, EU 15 increased 2.8%, Germany and UK by 4%. It was already explained saying the year before was a recession year, and now to swing back. But the fact is, they have legal commitments to reduce and not to increase. If you were to compare India and US, again, the way the narrative is, 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 is performed, between 2009 2010, what we read in the press was that India has increased by 9%, and US has increased by only 4%. But when you disaggregate the emissions and you start looking at the fact that what was the actual increase, you find that the Indian increase at 9% was still less than the US increase. And yet, this is an issue that is never discussed and certainly never talked about as loudly, as clearly, and as rudely as the emissions of the developing and the emerging world are talked about. What we believe very strongly is, therefore, that emissions are linked to growth. We know that. We also know very clearly that the already rich, the already industrialized world has emitted for their growth in the past. And it is a fact that the emerging economies will emit for their growth in the future. So what the world needs, it's not rocket science, but it's certainly a world in kindergarten which doesn't accept the fact that what the world needs simply is an agreement to cut which will have limits for all. And this frankly can only be based on equal entitlements for all countries. We're also saying, and I think that's very important because as environmentalists we want to transition to low carbon economies. We are not here as naysayers, we're not here to say that we want the right to pollute. But we also know we have the opportunity to reinvent growth without pollution. We also know that we have not built all the infrastructure as yet. But what the world is not willing to accept in hard facts is that this transition will cost. And so the costs will need to be paid. And there are no, there is no time now for cheap answers. If you look at what is happening here, if in terms of the Cancun Agreement, as CSC, we have made it clear to the government of India and to the rest of the world that we believe that the Cancun Agreement is bad for climate change and is bad for us. The pledges do not add up to effective action. That is well known today. It is well understood today that you are talking 
talking about perhaps going up to even 5 degrees centigrade if you look at all the convenient leakages and loopholes that exist in the pledges. But more than that, the Cancun Agreement, based as it is on voluntary action, junks the principle of common but differentiated action. It junks the principle of historical emissions and equity. Our friend Shivam is here, who has also done an analysis looking at the UNEP report. And I do want to make the point that it is a sad state of UN organizations, but they don't have the courage to put out the data that is need, needed to be put out because very clearly the assessment on the emission gap shows us that actually the gap is growing. That the developed, that the Annex 1 countries in the case of low pledges will do as little as zero. And if you even look at them in the high pledges, they will still do less than one the developing world will do. So the Cancun Agreement shifts the burden of the transition onto the developing countries. But, and even with the high pledges, as I said, and strict rule, Annex 1 will take on only 40% of the emission cuts between now and 2020. So the question I think that this community must be asking and should ask is who is not acting and who is the problem in negotiations. We are taking on the burden when we have the right to grow. And this is very important for us to recognize and for us to recognize the fact that you cannot talk about the future budget without talking about the historical emissions. This is data that we know very clearly. We know very clearly that the space has been occupied. It cannot be vacated. You cannot make a deal on the crumbs that are left behind and say, now you may do with it because this is all the space that we have left for you. Historical emissions are very much part of what will be the deal in the future. So the point that we would like to make is that historical is emissions and history is very much part of the future. You cannot dismiss historical emissions. You cannot write off differentiation between past polluters and future polluters. And action has to be taken based on contributions to the past stop as well as future limits on emissions. I don't think any country in the world is arguing that there should be no limits on their growth or on emissions. They are simply saying that that has to be done based on an equitable, fair sharing of the global carbon budget. And that clearly has to be a premise which is non-negotiable. And so finally, if I can say, we are definitely not asking for the right to pollute, but we are demanding in probably as unequivocal terms as possible, our right to development. That future agreement on climate change has to be based on the principle of differentiation and justice, and no other agreement can either be acceptable or will be effective. And I would like to underline the fact that for us, the effectiveness of the climate agreement is absolutely critical. But in a global deal on climate change, unless you have an agreement based on equity, you cannot limit emissions of countries that need the space to grow in the future. Thank you very much.